everybody. As you know, this morning, uh, today is Pastor Appreciation Day, and uh, I told Pastor that uh, I'd like to take care of everything for him, uh, take the whole day off. How many know that our pastors need to, I say pastors because his wife is just as much the pastor right along beside him, uh, so we say, I say pastors because I understand as a pastor's son uh, and also as a youth pastor and stuff like that, that the uh, wife is just as important, the encouragement there. Uh, she goes through just as much as he does as, as, you know, seeing all the hurt, you know, when somebody uh, is hurting and all that other stuff. So I wanted to make sure I took care of everything for him so that way he wouldn't have to. I wanted him to relax, receive. How many know that the, even the pastor needs to receive some, uh, uh, some of that too? So... This morning, I'm going to kind of do the announcements. Like I said, good morning to everybody. I hope everybody had a good weekend. Um, I want to thank everybody for, uh, who helped in the harvest party yesterday. Um, it was, uh, uh, well, they said they were parking them everywhere. So uh, we had a, a huge success there, which is awesome to do uh, when we can reach out to so many in the community and they can come and, and have a good time uh, and let them know that even Christians can have fun. Uh, T-shirts also and sweatshirts uh, that we had for sale is due today. Um, so if you want to, uh, today is the last day, uh, get them in, uh, your money. And also tonight is our fifth Sunday. So those that are wanting to sing and all that that are singing, please come. I mean, we have, a, we have an awesome time on our fifth Sunday with our singing and stuff. And God just really does some awesome stuff. Um, also, we do hats, uh, hats, gloves, and blankets. Uh, something that uh, uh, we do to hand out. We'll be passing them out on the uh, 18th of uh, November. So uh, please sign up if you want to come to help and hand them out. How awesome is it is to see, to give these things to the kids, you know, that don't have hats, don't have gloves, and don't have that stuff, and then to see how, you know, how rewarding it is to give. Because the Scripture says, God says we are to give. You know, we are to give to the poor, to those that, that are not as... Uh, um, it has as much as we do. Also, senior adults will be going to uh, the Delphi Assembly of God Christmas play. Uh, if you're wanting to do that, uh, your money needs to be turned into Sister Linda. Please turn that in. Um, that is an awesome show. I actually went there for quite a while as a youth pastor, and I was in a lot of that uh, Christmas play. Actually, I'm in it this year also, too. The uh, pastor's wife who's in charge of it, uh, they're, they're watching one that we've done in the past, and... Uh, there was a scene in there, a couple of scenes that we, we had, me and another guy that was always causing trouble in it. And uh, they were laughing so much, he said, we got to get you guys back. you got to do this scene again. So it's kind of exciting to do that. But please come to that. That's an awesome time, awesome ministry. Also for uh, choir, uh, Christmas choir, those that are wanting to do that uh, needs to meet with uh, Terry uh, for the Christmas choir. Um, he's wanting to do that, to get with him. Um, the other bald guy behind me, if you don't know who he is, um, just look for the shine. Make sure after the shine, it's the right shine. Uh, also, uh, no Sunday school next Sunday. It's our homecoming, so we will not have Sunday school next Sunday. Also, uh, no, uh, yes, church will start at 1030. Uh, please come to that. Uh, dinner afterwards, carry in. Uh, so uh, if you want to bring something in, that'd be awesome. Uh, and also, this morning, like we said, it's Pastor Appreciation and closing here. We also have a special guest that's going to be uh, uh, speaking for us and preaching for us this morning. Like I said, this is Pastor Appreciation. We want him to be fed also. Uh, it's also uh, Benny Baker is uh, who it is. Um, so, um, where is he at here? Uh, I thought I seen somewhere. He might not be here yet. Uh, but uh, uh, he will be speaking for us. Uh, so uh, please make sure that you just get in and just get involved as he preaches at this time. Uh, we got one more announcement here. That Thanks, Brother Roy. All right. Um, left over from the harvest party, uh, there around the pavilion are two huge pumpkins. I mean, I don't, I don't know, maybe each of them may weigh close to 100 pounds. So if someone would like one or both of those, just see me. And we have several bales of straw. If anybody would like to have any of those, please come and see me. At this time, we'll, uh, let's invite the Lord into our presence. Won't everybody please stand? We thank God for another day's journey. Amen. 
All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to come together one more time to worship you in spirit and in truth. We ask that you be with us in our service. Bless the speaker as the message is brought forth. Bless every song, prayer, and testimony that will be spoken. We ask, Lord, that we have ears to hear and hearts to receive your word and the good news. We ask that you keep your hand upon this church, keep your hand upon our pastor and his family, members, non-members, visitors. Just bless, just continue to bless us, Lord. We just thank you so much for all the mercies and blessings you have bestowed upon us. These favors we ask in your blessed name and glory. Amen. Amen. Let's sing this first song, church. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. Amen. Let's worship the Lord this morning. Well, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. Yes, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I promised him that I would serve him till I die. parts of vines, they just cut that stuff off and throw it in fire and it's burned up. But let's stay connected to the vine, amen. This song is Abiding in the Vine. Oh 
touch him, amen. Just give him praise this morning. My, my, my. Thank you, Jesus. Ooh. Isn't he sweet, church? This next song, and before we have our prayer request, is he's sweet, I know. My, my, my. I know we don't sing the song very much, but it's a, it's a, great, it's a good song. He's sweet, I know. Jesus, amen, amen. Let's worship him this morning, church.
many knows he's sweet. Sweet I know, oh, I tell yeah. you. The what for the Lord, where would we be? Takes us through so many. I tell you what, if you could look back on your on your life, there's probably so many times that you could look back and you could see, man, I didn't even realize how many times he's brought me through. More times than we can count, I'll guarantee you that. You say, well, brother, you don't know where I've been. I tell you right now, I guarantee you it's more than we realize. Because God has brought us through time and time again. At this time, those that may have a, a, a prayer request with a raise of hand, you're saying, brother, just remember me. I got, I got something that God needs to take care of. With a raise of hand, you're saying that I just, I'm living that, giving that to Him. I'm lifting that up to Him. With a, those that might have a lost loved one or an unspoken with another lift of hand, you're saying, brother, right here. Let me tell you something. God knows each and every one of you right now. He knows Amen. what you're going through. He knows your hurt. He knows your pains. And there is nothing, not one thing that you are going through that He cannot take care of. Yeah. There is nothing that is above Him. There is nothing beyond Him because He is an all-powerful God, right. almighty God. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to You right now. My God, we come to You lifting up these requests. God, You know these needs. You know each and every one. And God, we're lifting them up to You. Because God, we can't take care of them, but God, you can. And by giving them to you, God, we're saying that we're trusting in you. We're believing in you. Because God, there are no lines, there's no limits, there's nothing that you cannot do, God. In Jesus' name right now, we ask that you touch each and every one of those, God. Whether it's physical, spiritual, financial, God, God, move upon that right now, God. Those that are not here, that cannot make it, God, reach out to them. Let them feel your presence right now. God, those that are in the hospital, those that are sick, right now, God, let them feel your presence. Because, God, we know that you are everywhere. Touch them and just strengthen them. And we give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise. In Jesus' name. take up the offering. Uh, the ushers want to come. Jesus. 
I tell you, it's always good to be in a church where you can just feel His presence. Amen. Amen. You say, well, ain't that supposed to be the way it is? Well, let me tell you something. It ain't like that in every church. That's right. Sad to say, but that is not like that in every church. Jesus. Praise God, we got a, a church that is Holy Ghost filled church. Amen. Can't find a whole lot of those anywhere. Praise God. At this time, uh, if uh, Pastor Chris, you want to pray over the offering? Well, let me thank you, Lord, for this day that you have made. Father, we pray right now as we give in this offering, let us give with a cheerful heart. God, I pray, Lord, that we give not to man, but God, we give unto you. And we ask, God, that you bless every gift, bless those that have to give, and those that may not today. God, that you bless them as well, God, that the next time they might be able to give. Father, we ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Esther opens up her song by saying, All aboard, amen. amen. This song is, This train is bound for glory. This train is bound for glory. This train. not going to be any stowaways, None, nothing telling the conductor, well, wait a minute, i got to go back and get my luggage, i got to go back and do this, or there won't be none of that. That's right. we got to be ready, amen? Right. Be ready. That's the Roy, I'll turn it over to the hands of you. This time, for, uh, <laughs> break it, Brother Ray, if you want to come on up, I think your wife is wanting to sing, um, which is awesome. Um, excuse me, I didn't shut my phone off, sorry about that, now that's what's hollering. <laughs> um, but uh, if you want to come up, uh, you want to come up here, and uh, both of you here say something before then. Uh, got you a little water here if you need it. Um, it's awesome that we can have somebody come in and and uh, preach for our pastor. Um, it's awesome to to uh, I remember a little bit, and then I'm kind of like at first when they said it, I was like I can't remember. And then when I seen you guys, I'm like oh yes, I remember now. So it's awesome to see you guys. I'm going to give this service to you. Do what God tells you to do. And uh, God's going to do some awesome stuff. Amen. Can you give the Lord a hand clap of praise today? Amen. Amen. Well, if, uh, if he's been a little bit good to you, give him a little praise. Amen. But if he's been a whole lot good to you, give him a bunch of praise. Amen. Praise God. Isn't God good? Amen. What, what an honor it is to be here on this, uh, uh, this special Sunday, amen, as uh, we are in Pastor Appreciation Month, and we so appreciate, amen, Pastor Chris and his precious wife, and uh, what a blessing to the kingdom of God, amen. So uh, before my wife comes and sings, can we just give God uh, thanks for the gift of this house? Could we do that? So could you just give God a hand clap of praise for, amen, your precious pastor, and amen, and thank you so much, and of course... Amen. 
all those that are ministry here in the house. And, and uh, just real quick, you know, I pastored for uh, over 20 years. We pastored for 15 years uh, up in Waterloo, Iowa, before the past two years we've been full-time on the evangelistic trail. But um, uh, that's a calling within itself, you know, and you've got to know God's called you to do that. But uh, while I pastor, I'll just be honest, it's one of the hardest things I've ever done. You know, and we honor that gift, and we honor so much God for giving us that pastor. Amen. And so we're thankful today. Thank you so much for inviting us on this special Sunday. Amen. We don't believe we're here by chance or accident, but by divine appointment. Amen. So uh, my precious wife's going to come and sing. Amen. We've, uh, man, we've just, in fact, just this month, we've been together 24 years, 23 years married, and then another year before that. Man, that's a long time to put up with me, you know. So I don't know how I ever talked that girl into marrying me, but somehow I did. But uh, I'm glad it all worked out. So uh, can you just give her attention for a moment? Amen. And give God a hand clap of praise as she comes to sing. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, everybody. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. When He shall come with trumpet sound.
Lord. Amen, 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 amen. Praise God, praise God, praise God. If, uh, if it were possible, if I could have just a little monitor just in my mic, amen. Thank you so, yeah, thank you so much. That sounds great. Amen. Um, today I want to preach to you a message entitled, uh, Seven Things You Better Have Nailed Down Before the Storm. Amen. And so uh, this morning I'd just like to share with my, my heart with you just a little bit. And uh, once again, it's just an honor to be here. I thank uh, so many ministry friends and, and partners and family from the area that's been out. And, and so thankful for you all for allowing us to come. As, as I was praying, I was seeking the Lord. You know, um, we travel, you know, I was, uh, we were adding up just the past few weeks how many times we've been out ministering in the past, in the past year, this year. And we've been at, uh, ministered 178 times up to, up to today. And uh, we're excited about what God has has for us next. Uh, been in services all over America and other countries and, and just watch God do some awesome things. But, but today is about you right here, right now. You know, God loves you so much. The Bible tells us that he sent his son, amen, to die for each of you. But, but also know that he sends you that pastor, that teacher, that evangelist, the apostle, the prophet, to release a word into our spirit, a life-changing word. So today, however the plan was formulated, God, God destined for us to be together on this day. Amen? So how awesome is that to think that God planned for this day for us to be together? So in thinking about that, I began to think about all the messages that God has given me through the years. And of course, as an evangelist, there are messages that God releases through me that I literally take from church to church to church because I believe it's a message for that time. But today, I don't have one of those messages. I don't have a message that I've preached a thousand times, or I don't think I have any that I've preached a thousand times, but, but that I've repeated, re, uh, repeatedly preached. Today, I have something special that I feel like is just for you today. Amen? So uh, as we get into the service today, if we could just pray and, and uh, ask God to come and let his Holy Spirit move in a mighty way. Could we do that? Lord, we thank you for this day. God, I thank you for the opportunity to be here. God, I thank you for the privilege and the honor of being at your holy desk to be able to proclaim the word of God. God, we ask that your Holy Spirit, Lord, as he has been welcomed in this place over and over and over again. Holy Spirit, we, sir, we ask that you move mightily in this place place today. God, if there are those that need a healing, let that come forth today, Lord. There are those that need a miracle, a breakthrough, prodigals coming home, prodigal sons and daughters. Lord, uh, let a word be spoken that changes our lives forever. And if there's anyone that does not have Jesus in their heart, begin to speak to them at this point even now. We ask that change take place in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, so it says this in Mark chapter 16, verse 16, and I'm going to read uh, four or five scriptures today and, and come through this message in a timely manner. But uh, Mark 16 and 16 says this. It says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Amen. So today I want to talk to you about seven things you ne need to have nailed down before the storm. So everybody knows there's going to be a storm, right? It's not if a storm is going to come, it's when a storm is going to come. We moved from the Midwest down to Arkansas, where we've lived the past couple years, and that's where our ministry has its home base out of. And uh, the weather difference is unbelievable. Unbelievable. I mean, uh, it, it, uh, i just be honest with you guys. I grew up in the South. We spent about 20 years in the Midwest, and the time being back in the South, it's amazing. You know, last year we got an inch of snow. It shut the city down. You know, of all places, I was in Dallas, Texas when the snow came, and, and uh, we had an inch in Dallas, and you know, nobody went anywhere, you know. Of course, I was thinking about not long ago, I just used to live out here on 52, lived in a little rent house not far from here. And I can remember times when the snow would literally be, be piled up this high where the plows had come by and piled it up over and over again on my driveway, and I would have to get out and I'd have to shovel, it, sometimes getting up even in the middle of the night, just so I could get my car out. So I could be at church on time on a Sunday morning or, uh, or uh, up uh, and be at the church or be at the school and so I could do what, what I was called to do. And I began to think about all of those things and when we got a whole inch of snow and it shut our city down, I couldn't help but sit back and laugh. You know, because, because uh, I pull in today and what a beautiful fall day. I mean, it is just beautiful. The atmosphere is amazing. And here in this church service, what an absolutely amazing atmosphere that God has come in and blessed us with today. And I look out and I'm thinking, y'all, it's just a matter of time until it snows. 
It's, I know it's beautiful today, you know, and I know we're all hoping you get another three or four 70 or 75 degree days, but you know it's, it's, it's an impending storm is out there somebody waiting, waiting in wake for you. Well, just as that's the case in the natural, no, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that's the case in your life. It's not if there is going to be a storm, it's when there is going to be a storm. Now, I know that God will give us the grace to walk through those things, but, uh, but I, I've never lived in the world where nothing goes wrong. I know there may be some folks out there under the sound of my voice that your dishes never get dirty, your car never breaks down, uh, you uh, got Kool-Aid coming out your water faucet and your breath don't stink, but that's just not the world that I have been blessed to live in. Sometimes we need a mint. <laughs> Sometimes we just go through some stuff, and that's okay, you know. God is not judging you because you went through something. God is not mad at you because you have gone through something. God has not lifted his hand of protection off of you just because you've went something. To the contrary, we've got it mixed up. We think when things go wrong that we must have done something and the judgment of God is coming into our life. But today I propose to you this question. Maybe you did something right. Maybe you're fighting with everything you've got and the enemy is just mad at you and he wants to stop, you, stop your destiny from coming to pass. Maybe the reason you've been fighting as hard as you've been fighting is because you finally realized who you've been called to be in Christ. I want you to know when I was sitting on a pew not bothering anybody, the enemy didn't bother me too much. But the moment I stepped into my calling and began to go out and do what God called me to do, it seemed like all hell broke loose against my life, against my against my family, against my finances, against my physical body. When we begin to do what God calls us to do, that's when the enemy puts a target on our back. Friend, today, maybe you're fighting. You've got some areas in your ministry you've been fighting in, some areas in your family that you've been fighting in, some physical things in your body that you've been fighting. Today, I want you to know it's not because God is mad at you, but it's because you've become a threat to hell. It's because the enemy is mad at you. He wants to stop the vision of this church. He wants to stop the vision of these people and keep you from doing what God has called you to do. I want you to know right now there is a storm that's coming, but today I believe God sent me here to prepare you for that storm, to release a word that when that storm comes, you can say that preacher stood on that platform and he told me that the storm was coming, but when it came, everything was going to be all right. Friend, I want you to know you don't have to lose your mind when everything goes wrong around you. A storm is coming. A few years ago when I was pastoring, I had, we, we, had the, we lived in a parsonage next door to our church. And it was a, it was a cold January day. Uh, the, uh, the, the temperature and the weather in Iowa, where we lived at in Waterloo, Iowa, was, was really similar to here. But we got a lot more snow than what we did when we lived in Indiana. And I had come out of our, the parsonage one day and was getting in my van. And it was a windy day and snow was piled up. You know, we'd had, I think we had about 46 inches at that time. And uh, in front of the church, the, the, the front of our church looks real similar to yours. And snow was piled up pastor, I mean, a story high in front of the church. And we have a sign out front, and there's a big snow drift. And I walk out, and I'm getting in the van, and here, all of a sudden, I hear, pastor. And I'm thinking, am I hearing things? And I stop, and I'm standing in the driveway, and I'm looking around, and I'm thought, Lord, your servant is here, but it wasn't the Lord, you know. And, uh, and I hear, pastor. And I'm thinking, Lord, am I losing my mind? What is going on? And I, I just, I pass it off. I think it's the wind or maybe it's a television or something. And I get in my car and I hear it a third time. I hear, pa, and much more panic this time, pa, stop. And I stop. And I go barreling through the snow. And our secretary was at the church doing some work. And she had a little three-year-old boy. And that little three-year-old boy had gotten out of the church somehow and had found his way to the bottom of a snowdrift. And I guess he heard me coming out of the house, and he's yelling, Pastor, helping, hoping I would come help him. Brother, I went down, and I literally, I, I hear it, I'm digging snow away, and I see his little tracks, and, and he can't get out of the snow, dude. I lean down, and I pull him out, and this little boy does not have a coat on. He don't have any socks on, no gloves. I mean, this is like one of the coldest day of the year. I grab him, I wrap my arms around him. He buries his face in my neck. He looks at me and says, my mom knows right where I am. 
Ooh, I said, we better have an altar call after this because your mama does not know where you are. I want you to know it wasn't if the storm was coming, it was when it was coming. And I want you to know sometimes stuff gets lost in a storm. But God's going to send somebody by to pull you out of a snowbank. Come on, somebody. God's going to send somebody by you at the right place at the right time to pull you out to make sure that you will be safe during the storm. Have you ever been stuck on the side of the road? Have you ever been stranded? I remember one year on my birthday, we literally got snowed in in town. And uh, all the roads were shut down. We weren't going anywhere. We couldn't, uh, we couldn't get out to buy groceries. The lights are flashing. But we were prepared. We had candles. We had, we had plenty of milk and bread. You know, that's what you do when the snow comes. You go buy milk and bread. I don't know why, but just it's just what we do, you know. So I guess we can eat bread sandwiches and drink milk and be okay. But we got plenty of that, so we are prepared for the storm. And so today I want you to know there are some things that you need to have nailed down before the storm ever comes. Because I want you to know a little bit of prevention is better than a whole lot of cure. So as we as God's people can stand and say, I'm ready for whatever comes my way, that's when we can really accomplish something for the kingdom of God. Years ago, there was a, a precious man, he called me up, and he uh, uh, invited me to breakfast. I didn't get the message, I didn't talk to him in person, I got the message later. And he called and said, brother, I would like to meet you uh, for breakfast, and there was a restaurant not far from me a Perkins uh, 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 Perkins restaurant and and said we'd love to meet you at Perkins could you come and meet me and so I tried to call him back for three or four days and could not reach this precious man and so uh, finally after three or four days I got a hold of him and he went on to tell me that he had been in the hospital and that he was in the final stages of AIDS and that he would like to just meet with a fellow brother. He was on his way through, and he was headed, I forget what part of Philadelphia he was headed to, and he said that he wanted to just stop and, and, uh, and, and fellowship with, a, with another brother in Christ. And so I didn't know what to expect. But when I got uh, out of my car that day, and I went into Perkins, and I'm standing there, and this young man walks in. He weighed about 90 pounds. We were the same age. He weighed about 90 pounds, and he looked like he was 65 or 70 years old. And he came feebly walking into the Perkins, and he came in, and we sat down, and he just began to share his heart with me. And he said that I'm on my way to, to Philadelphia, to Pennsylvania, and he said that, that uh, my mother and father have uh, disowned me. And I said, why would your parents do that at this time in your life? And he said, well, he said, well Brother Pity, when I was living an alternate lifestyle, they celebrated me. When I was living a lifestyle that didn't challenge faith or I didn't talk about God or Jesus or any of those things, he said, nobody bothered me. They all loved me and they appreciated me. He said, but when I found Jesus, they turned their backs on me. And he said, I'm on my way right now to my parents' house hoping we can make amends and we can work this thing out. And, uh, and, he, and he said that he had gone to their house before and nothing happened. He said that the, he had called me and he'd had a, a, a breakdown and ended up back in the hospital and had to have a blood transfusion and went through so many things. They looked at me with tears streaming down his face. He said, Brother Benny, more than anything, I just want my relationship restored with my mother and father before I die and go to heaven. Friend, there are some things that we've got to have nailed down before we meet Jesus. There are some things we have got to have nailed down before we see the face of God. And he said to me, he said, before I lay my hands, my eyes on Jesus, I just want to see my mom and dad one more time, and I want to let them know that, they, that I love them. He said, I don't need them to love me at this time of my life. I don't need them to stand up with me. I don't need them to celebrate me today. I just need them to know how much I love them. And will you pray with me that I can make this trip and safely get to my mom and dad's and then embrace me. Now from the heart of a father, I listen to this and I think there is nowhere my child would go that I would not love them anymore. There is no sin that they would be covered in that I wouldn't be willing to go to the pig pen and pull them out of myself. There is no place that I would be willing to go. And I looked at this man who was going through the biggest storm of his life and partied a miracle in the next few days he's going to lay his eyes on Jesus. But I want you to know he was riddled with AIDS. His body was, was covered in sores. His, his face was disfeatured. He was weak from all the medication that he was on. But I want you to know he had it nailed down. He had every I dotted, 
every T crossed because he knew today if he died, he would spend an eternity in heaven. Oh, he didn't want anything from anyone but to just have the love of Christ shared everywhere he went. I bought that precious man breakfast and I told him, I said, well, I want you to know that if you don't have family in Philadelphia, you do right here. And even though uh, you are not blood family through Christ, we are now brothers. And now that I know you, I want you to know that we're praying for you and we're standing in the gap for you. Friend, we've got to get it nailed down now because there's not a one of us that is promised a tomorrow. There is not a one of us that know 100% we will roll out of our bed tomorrow. So we have to make sure that we got it nailed down now. We've got to make sure that we have it right, right now. And the Word of God says in Mark 16 and 16, it says, He that believeth in me and is baptized... He shall be saved. My, we have got to believe in Jesus no matter what. There are going to be times and moments in your life when your relationship with Christ is going to be challenged, but you've got to believe no matter what. You can come to me, and I love my wife, and I have absolute faith and belief in my wife, but it would be possible for maybe you to tell me that she said she didn't like something or she liked something. That's possible. Uh, you could come to me and talk to me about Pastor Chris, and you could say he has this feeling or that feeling about this, that, or the other. And I, I could say, well, I, I know him, and, and I would say he believes this, this, and this, but these things I don't know him well enough to know. But this I do know. You come to me and you start talking to me about Jesus, I know Jesus. I have a daily relationship to him. I talked to him this morning. I know his likes and his dislikes. I know when he is smiling on me and when he's not happy with me. And I want you to know that I believe in him no matter what. No matter what, no matter, somebody could say, well, you know, this miracle thing, it was for yesterday. No, it's done too late. I've done seen miracles. I've seen too many people touched by the power of God. I've seen too many miracles take place, and you can't tell me now it's done too late. And you might say, but that healing thing was for yesterday. No, that's not true. My wife, who was never supposed to have any children, we now have three children, and that's an absolute miracle of God. Friend, I want you to know you've come too late to tell me that God is not still in the healing business. You can't convince me that his love for me is not great because I already know that it is. I know that he not only loved me so much that he died for me, that he takes care of me every day. I don't have one bill I've got to worry about because the Bible says that he takes care of all my needs according to his riches and glory. I don't have a son or a daughter that I have to be concerned about because my Bible tells me that he will take care of my children. Friend, I want you to know today, you've got to get some things buckled down right now before the storm ever comes and the first thing you need to do is you've got to believe in Jesus and his word no matter what what are we standing on today when they came to my wife and they told her that they told her cancer and they, and they spoke that words not far from here or just a little clinic not far from here and they told her that she had cancer and I'll never forget her response to the doctor and go the doctor was just doing his job we had no uh, disrespect for the doctor or the nurse but when my wife pointed her finger at that doctor and said you're not going to take from me my health that God has given me the doctor got upset and walked out we weren't mad at him but we weren't happy with his diagnosis we weren't mad at people, but we were mad at the enemy. And friend, I want you to know we stood on the word of God that says, By his tribes I am healed. By his tribes I was healed. By his tribes I will be healed. I'm here to tell you, my God is still a healer, and he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond anything we could ever hope, imagine, or dream. It's done too late to tell me that Jesus is not in the healing business. If he healed blinded eyes when he walked this earth, Jesus said, the things you see me do, greater things shall you do, because i got to go to my Father. Anything you saw or read in the Bible that Jesus did, you can do too. you got to believe no matter what. No matter what's going around you, you just have to stand and say, Lord, I believe in you. That don't mean it's not going to be hard. I remember here not long ago about 3 o'clock in the morning, I got, the, I got a call. You, you ever got one of those 3 o'clock in the morning calls, Pastor? It's the one that you don't want to hear. It's where tragedy has struck. It's where, where pain has struck. It's where, you, you, I don't know why it seems that it is in those moments that we get bad news. But for whatever reason, during that watch, I had gotten some really bad news. This was about a year ago. And I, the, when I'm talking to this person on the phone, 
and I'm not computing what it is that they're saying to me. And I sat up on the side of my bed and I said, say it again, I don't understand what you're saying. And I could not compute the, the news that I was receiving. I won't go into details of it, but it was an incident that had happened in uh, my wife and I's family and with our kids. And, and I, I wasn't computing what was going on. And so I'm, I said, tell me again. And after three or four times, they, I, it finally started registering. And I'm coming to grips with this. And I'm trying to talk to the person on the other end and get details and find out everything that was going on. And by now, my wife is up and she's saying, what's going on? And, and she's trying to hear my phone conversation. And then my daughter gets up and, and they realize all these things are happening. And, and my wife is upset and she's weeping and my daughter is weeping. And then my other son comes in and he finds out what's going on and he's weeping. And I'm trying to maintain enough composure to get through this conversation. And I'm praying with the people on the other end but still there's a concern in my life for what's going on in my own immediate family. And so when I got off the phone, I explained it all to my wife. And I sat on the side of my bed, and I just started talking to God. I, I know there are those that use great these and thous, and they're great orators of great prayers. That's not me. I just talk to Jesus like I talk to any one of you. And I sat on the side of my bed, and I said, Jesus, I don't understand why I'm going through this storm right now. I don't know why I've got to fight like I'm fighting right now and tears streaming down my face I threw both of my hands up in the air and said God I, even though I don't understand any of this I love you and I trust you friend when you start going through a storm you've got to have the kind of belief that says no matter what the outcome all will be well and I said God I trust you and I choose to praise you no matter what friend if you'll just start praising him in the storm storm. There is something that takes place when you start praising God that makes the enemy run the other way. It makes no sense. Somebody says, why should I praise him when I got bad news? Why should I praise him when the doctor gave me a bad report? It's because it will confuse your enemy. The enemy will look at you and say, how can you praise God going through what you're going through? And when he gets confused, he can't attack you anymore. See, when you begin to praise God anyway, it changes everything. Changes everything. Believe. Believe no matter what. Believe that Jesus is going to make a way. Believe in His Word for you. There is, the Word says that, Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the ends of the earth. The Bible goes as far to say that if you make your bed in hell, I'll still be with you. So no matter what lifestyle you have chosen to live, whether you've lived a lifestyle of peace or love, or there's been chaos and, and, and hectic lifestyle all around you, know Jesus says, I am with you no matter what. The second thing, Acts 2 and 22, it says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Man, you've got to have that nailed down. There, there's no gray area here. You've got to call on Him, and you've got to call on His name. Uh, can I just be transparent today? That would be all right for a minute. We, if, you can, if you turn on a football game today, you're going to see somebody thanking God for a touchdown. You know, and I'm not, I'm not hating that. I'm not mad at that, but you're going to see that. You're going to see somebody standing with a little gold statue who makes billions of dollars and have no relationship with Jesus whatsoever, but they'll hold that up and say, oh, first, I want to thank God for my statue. How silly is that? Not taking away from their personal conviction or belief. But it's very easy to say that I trust, I thank, or I believe in God. But it is a different thing when you say the name Jesus. Because you have not only said, I believe in a God or the God, you've put an identity to the God that you are believing in. And it's the Jesus Christ that offends folks. It's the Jesus Christ who makes people go the other way. It's the Jesus Christ that they've said, you can name his, use his name in vain as much as you want, but you can't say it between the times of 7 and 10 p.m. on national television during prime time. You can't do it because he's offensive and he offends folks. Friend, I want you to know Jesus said this. He told his disciples one day he said I did not come to bring peace I came to bring a sword I came because there would be those that would follow me because they love me but there would be others that my presence in a room would make them angry and want to hate me and want to pick up stones and kill me 
And whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. More than once, I've just had to stop and say, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. More than once, I've just had to stop and I've had to believe no matter what, everything was going to be okay. I knew if I called on his name, everything would be all right. One time, I, we had a local television program for years, and, and uh, the, the area, that market that we lived in, if you had basic cable, you couldn't get TBN or any of the uh, network Christian channels. So the, the local channel that we were on, that's the channel that people watch church on. So there was a handful of guys in our area, in our market, that had a television program. And it went from there to where we had a regional program. We were able to reach people in the, uh, the northeast region of Iowa. And it was, it was, uh, it was, it was so, we've seen so many people saved and so many lives has changed through just uh, uh, being on television for uh, just an hour a week. It was just life-changing for us. But because of that, there were a lot of people who came through the church and a lot of people who became a part of our ministry. And our, it was able to let us reach out really far. But it also challenged us in many ways. And one day I was just back in the back part of the house. And uh, it was a Saturday afternoon and I was just kind of praying. And, and my wife takes this phone call. And she comes in and she said, you, you really should take this call. And I said, do you know who that is? And, and she said, no, I, I don't know, but he's frantic. So this young man's crying and weeping. And he said, I said, well, let, let me talk to him. And I took the phone and what I did, I hear this voice on the other end. Pastor, he's screaming. He said, preacher! He's screaming at the top of his lungs. Preacher, I need you to pray. I need you to pray right now. And I said, sir, I said, I said, what's going on? I don't recognize the voice. I don't know who it is. He's nobody I'm in relationship with. And he said, I need you to pray right now. And I said, sir, I said, if you could just calm down for a moment. I said, I'd be glad to pray with you. What's going on? And he said, you don't know me. I've watched your television program, and we've been through the church a few times, but we've never met personally. And he said, my daughter is missing. And he says, and we need to find out where my daughter is right now. I need you to pray. I want you to know this is how we are going to reach the world. This is how, that's how we're going to reach the world. Because right now, people want to know how they're going to reach Buddhists. I'm going to tell you how. They're going to have sick and lost and dying children. And they are going to come to the house. They're going to come to the church. They're going to come to the God who knows how to get in touch with heaven. And when they pray, stuff happens. Come on, somebody. And said said, I need you to pray because my daughter is lost. And even though you don't know me and I don't know you, I believe if you'll pray, God will tell you where my daughter is. And I said, sir, I said, listen, I love you. And I, and I believe that Jesus is going to tell us where your daughter is. And she's going to come home safe and sound. But I can't just go in and pray a magic prayer or a formulated prayer that will just bring an instant result. But what I can do, I can call upon the name of Jesus. And he's going to answer us. And we are going to believe no matter what that all will be well. Come on, somebody. And we went into prayer. I called every prayer warrior I knew. And I told him the story of this little girl that, that was lost and we needed to find her now. And we spent the next hour just on our face before God, calling on the name of Jesus. The Bible said, if one can set a thousand at flight, then two can set ten thousand. And then if we use that math, we can set a, a hundred thousand and a million and hundred million and a billion. My God, what happens when the church comes together and we get together and we pray in unity? And we began to pray, and we prayed, and we prayed until I got a phone call a couple hours later from this young man. And this time I have a very excited man on the other end of the phone. And he said, Brother Benny, Brother Benny, he said, we found my daughter. Listen to the miracle of what happened. This precious little girl had been abducted. She had been kidnapped. And they had taken her, and for some reason they had let her go and dropped her over a ravine about two, uh, two stories down. Uh, they had not taken her life, but let's just say she had been through some terrible things. And a bus went driving by the very spot that she was at, and the bus broke down. Come on, somebody. And the people got off the bus, and they heard the cry of this little girl, and they called the police. Friend, I want you to know God orchestrated a miracle on behalf of those people because somebody said, I am going to call on the name of Jesus. 
What are you in need of today? Call upon the name of Jesus and he'll save you from your situation. Man, what the church needs, can I, I, I just, just trying to be transparent today. I believe in the spirit of revival. I believe in the spirit of Pentecost. I'm glad I'm in a place that appreciates the Holy Ghost. Because I've been thrown out of places because we were too Pentecostal. Come on, somebody. Y'all, y'all ain't mad at me, are you? But we've been thrown out because we're too Pentecostal. Well, I want you to know if we're too Pentecostal, then you better get a hold of Paul because Paul was pretty Pentecostal. You better get a hold of Peter because he was there on the day of Pentecost when, where they were all baptized with the power of the Holy Ghost. That's what the church needs again. We need to get back to the power of the Holy Ghost. We need to get back to calling on the name of Jesus and seeing people saved and healed and set free and delivered by the power of the Holy Ghost. We had a young girl come by our house the other day, and she was just sharing. She was a friend of one of our children, and and, uh, she's a little Baptist girl. And she comes in. She came and was in service with us uh, a couple of weeks ago, and this is what she said. She said, you know, I've been to a lot of church service. She grew up in church, loves Jesus, I mean, but she's never experienced the power of God. Man, to me, that's like telling a bulldog to sick him. Because <laughs> I'm thinking, we're about to show you the power of the Holy Ghost, because that's the kind of God we serve, right? Man, that's, what the, that's how the church ought to be. We're about to show you the power of the Holy Ghost, right? And she said, but I felt something in that service that I've never felt in my life. And I said, sis, it was the Holy Ghost. Because the Bible said that there would be a generation that had a church that had a form of godliness. Come on, somebody. But it would deny the power thereof. I'm thankful to be in a place where the power of the Holy Ghost is welcome. I'm thankful to be in a place where the presence of God, we come in with open arms saying, God, whatever it is you want to do today, God, I'm a willing participant. If you want to save somebody, save them. If you want to heal somebody, heal them. But we've shut the door on the Holy Ghost these days. We've shut the door. Man, it's time to nail some stuff down. I just, I'd ask you if I could be honest again, but I think you're pretty good with me being honest up to this point, so I may as well not stop now. But we are building churches that are a mile high. We just, uh, we just had uh, one of the missionaries that we support was just in Africa, and they have a church there that is a mile long, Pastor. It's a mile long. And we have built in churches that are a mile long, but they're not an inch deep. <laughs> they're shallow. Have a shallow relationship with Jesus. And that, what we need is the power of God back in the church again. <laughs> That's how we're going to reach the world. We, uh, my wife and I, we travel all over. My, uh, we, we've still got a 17-year-old daughter in high school, and my youngest son is in his second year of college. And, and, uh, but, man, we travel and do whatever God tells us to do. And somebody came in one time. And uh, just, just in the past couple of weeks, we just got back from a long trip on the East Coast. And last year we flew out there, and, you know, that's great. You know, we don't mind doing that. But, you know, by the time we end up renting a car and spending all the time driving from place to place to place, it just ends up working out to drive. So, brother, one way it was 20 hours just to get to our first destination. And uh, the way the trip worked out, we didn't have places to stop in between or on the way back. But, so we, just, we drove 20 hours one way just to be at our first destination. And then at the end of the trip, after three weeks of traveling, literally preaching somewhere every night, and then getting in the car and driving 20 hours back home, somebody says, how can you do that? I'll tell you why. It's because we want to reach as many people as we can with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why we do what we do. I want to see as many people as I can healed by the power of the Holy Ghost. I want to see wheelchairs emptied out. I want to see blinded eyes open. I want to see deaf ears open. And we've seen those things. But, friend, I want you to know we've not seen anything yet. I believe there's a move of God coming to the church that is so powerful and so profound that the religious folk of the day won't be able to handle it. But there's a remnant of the church that's going to rise up and say, I remember the power of God. I remember when we gathered at the altar on a a Sunday morning and somebody spoke in tongues and somebody fell out under the power of the Holy Ghost and somebody got healed and somebody got changed. That's why we need the power of the Holy Ghost today. 
I, I need to move on. I, I'm almost, y'all enjoying this? We okay? You know, John chapter 10, 10 verse, uh, verse 9, Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, shall he be saved. And he go in or out and find pasture. Can I, can I just be honest with you? We have got this thing today that say all roads lead to heaven. Don't matter how you live. Don't matter what you do. Don't matter how you find Jesus. I have heard, I heard somebody just recently say, they say, you see that rock over there? If I want to worship that rock, that rock is my way to God. And I can worship that rock and I'll get to heaven. And that sounds so silly to us, right? Because we know that we have access to the Father only through His Son who gave His life for us, and that's Jesus Christ. And what we have done, we have cultivated a greasy grace in the church today that says you can live how you want to live. And you, you, you can't tell us. You can't tell the difference in a saved person on the street and somebody that's uh, in the church or not in the church on the road anymore today. You can't tell the difference. And it's a greasy grace that says anything goes. Live any way you want because all roads lead to heaven. It is unfortunate that there will come a day that we will all stand before the Lord. And can I just be honest? There is no way to heaven but through Jesus Christ. It does not matter what they tell you. I don't care how prominent the preacher I don't care how big the church is or how big the ministry is or how much money somebody makes or how poor they are. There is access to the Father only through the Son, and that's Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the door. How many have walked through that door? The Bible says the way to heaven is narrow, but the way to destruction is broad. That's pretty cut and dry, isn't it? I just watched as a nationally known evangelist on television said these words. He said, broad is the way to heaven. Broad is the way to the kingdom of God. And that was God's intention. That's what he said. God's intention all along was for you to be, but that's contrary to the word. See, that's why you've got to have it nailed down. That's why you've got to have that word in you. I know pastor preaches the word. I know hear that. You're going to get the word Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday. Now, I know that, but I want you to know that you also got to get in your Bible and get yourself early. And before work, you need to read that word. And you need to be in that word every day and studying it and knowing it for yourself. If we open up our Bible on Sunday morning and that's it, there's a problem inside of here. Because we have to hear that word and know that word for ourselves. Because the enemy would love to lead you astray. Because somebody would say he's prominent, so he must know what he's talking about. But if you, if you know the word, it doesn't matter how prominent, it doesn't matter how good they sing, or how loud they preach, or how much they jump, or shout, or what you, what you consider to be right or wrong. What we have to do is recognize Jesus is the only way to salvation. There is no other way. Muhammad ain't going to get you there. Buddha's not going to get you there. Hare Krishna's not going to get you there. Good works aren't going to get you there. What's going to get you to heaven is a relationship with Jesus Christ. A relationship. Day-to-day -day relationship. When I go before the Lord and I talk to Him, I talk to Him like this. Jesus, I just love you. You're my favorite person. <laughs> Holy Ghost, don't get mad, but I just, I'm just in love with Jesus, you know? He's my favorite person in the world. I just talk to Him like He's my best friend because He is. He has stuck closer to me than any brother. When, when people that said they were my best friends walked out on me, when people lied and ridiculed and manipulated, Jesus still stood there with open arms and said, Son, I'm here for you and I love you no matter what. And people say, well, Jesus loves you no matter what. You know what? He does. He does, but that don't mean you have a relationship with Him. Psalms... Uh, 69 and 28, it says, Let them be blotted out of the book of the living God and not be written with righteousness. Now, we should be separate. We ought to be different from the world. And that's an unbelievable thought to, have, uh, to be blotted out from the book of life. That's an unbelievable thought. And then Matthew 10 and 22 says, This last scripture I'm going to read today because I'm almost done. It says, And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endure to the end shall be saved. Endure, endure the storm. But Bill, if we can just endure, what if you are five minutes from the greatest breakthrough of your life? 
What if you are five minutes from such an outpouring of the Holy Ghost? But, but I prayed, and I prayed, I prayed, I prayed. Some precious friends of ours, uh, they, they pastor in Shawnee, Oklahoma. We just had, we just had two weeks of revival that broke out there. You know, we, we went in for a couple of days, and pastor, we had two weeks of revival. Power of God was moving. People were being saved and delivered and set free. And back in 2000, this church was praying for revival. God, send us revival. Send us a move of God. Send us a move of God. Every day at 6 o'clock, they got up and they came to the church. And sometimes it was just the pastor and his wife. And then other days, it was the pastor, his wife, and two people. And then there were days that there were 80 people at sun, on, on every morning at 6 o'clock praying. My point is, it doesn't matter if it's five people, ten people, or two people. We just need to be praying for a move of God inside of our lives, right? And my precious, my precious friends, they were praying and believing in God. And a uh, little storefront church, Pastor, a little Pentecostal Church of God storefront. And uh, they're, they're believing for a move of God, and every day they're praying. Well, all of a sudden they have a revival. And uh, just a couple days of meeting. And Brother Bill, they, they went from a couple days of meeting, they decided, let's go through Wednesday. And they said, well, let's go through Friday, and God just started moving. And people started coming from everywhere, all over the region. Uh, uh, Shakota, Oklahoma, you know, is famous because that's where Carrie Underwood's from, you know. But that's, you know, if, if you're familiar with that kind of music, you know. But th it's, a, it's a tiny town the size of Stockwell. There's just nobody there. You know, there's no work. There's, there's nothing, you know. And, and all of these people start coming from everywhere. And after a week, they decide, well, let's, let's go another week. And so they decided, let's have another week of revival on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And my pastor said that, that we started praying. He said, Brother Benny, we started praying and saying, all right, God, we, we don't want to just spin our wheels here. We want to know that this is a sovereign move of God. And they began to pray, all right, God, said, we're, we're, if, if, if this is it and we've had two great weeks of revival and all the people that have been saved and healed and delivered, that's great. I'm good with that. But Lord, if you've got something else for us, we've got to know by Friday night. Not that they were putting a mandate on God. They were just saying, God, we just love you and we want to be in your will. Have you ever been there? And my friend said that they prayed the next three days. At the end of the service on Friday night, they were ready to just close, close it out and say, we've had God done some awesome things. It wasn't that there weren't, weren't attendance. You know, I'm just tired of just going to church. You know, I want God to move every time we show up, right? I, I know that's the heart of the house. You know, I know that. But I, and, and that's what they were believing for. So my friend, the uh, pastor and his wife, they were going through and they were praying for everybody. She's about this tall. I'm, I'm not, she is this tall. And she's going through, and she's just such a precious woman of God, precious woman of prayer. And her and her husband, they're praying for people. It's funny because he's this tall, you know. And they're praying for people, and they come to this little, this little, this little mama and this precious little baby girl. Now she's six, seven years old, and she's blind. She's never saw, listen to this, never saw in her life. And she's standing there, and my little friend, who's about the same height, <laughs> you know, she takes this woman and she holds her and she starts praying over her. And speaking, speaking to this body, commanded it to fall subject to the word of God. And speaking healing. That little girl, and she might have spent ten minutes praying with this one little girl. And her husband's done moved down. And, and she stepped back and she walked away. And she said she felt the power of God moving so strong. But she went to the mom. And she went over to pastor. She started praying for the mom. And as she did, she felt a little tug on her, on her jacket. And said that the mom looked down and said, shh, be quiet. And she felt another little tug on her jacket. And she said, baby, she said, don't, don't bother mama. Mama's getting prayer. And she went back to pray and tugged that jacket that third time. And the mama leaned down, looked that little baby in the face and said, sis, you've been prayed for. Let mama get prayed for. And that little girl who had never seen in her life looked at her mama and said, but mama, I can see. I can see. And for the first time in her life, that baby seed, they broke out into two years of revival. Over 130,000 people went through that little storefront church that seats around 120 people on a big Sunday. 120 people in a city of 1,000 people. And uh, thousands and hundreds of thousands of people went there and was saved and healed and delivered. Needless to say, they realized God wants us to go another night. <laughs> Isn't God good? 
And that's the kind of God that we serve. That's the kind of God that you're connected to today. That's the kind of God who's wanting to move for you in this place today. Did you know that? When you rolled out of your bed today, the Lord said, I want to move for you. I believe you. When you got out of bed today, you didn't come here by chance or accident. You came because I believe there's a divine appointment with heaven. Could you stand on your feet with me today? If, I, I don't know what uh, your protocol is, but if somebody could come to, the, to one of the instruments and, and play or... Uh, Amen, that would just be great. Thank you so much. Amen. Could you just lift up your little hands and love on Jesus for a minute? Jesus, I love you, Jesus. I love you so much. I love you so much, precious Lord. Jesus, I just love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Lord, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Lord, I just love you, Jesus. If you could just play something soft and... And nice just for a minute and amen. Just love on Jesus for a minute. Holy Spirit, as we've come before you today and Lord, we just ask.